ladies and gentlemen, welcome. <clears throat> I got something stuck in my throat. All right, three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a Wild Time YouTube channel podcast show, whichever one that um, we end up using. So it's, it's kind of a uh, work in progress right now. But tonight I have a special guest for, well, let's put it to you like this. Tonight's episode, tonight's show will be pro wrestling. And it's going to be our top five favorite heels, which is ironic because I got one of the hottest heels in independent wrestling right now running rough shot over in West Virginia. You may know him as part of the working class with Griffin and your good friend. Bishop, well, I mean, just... We're known as a working class. We're the hottest team going today in professional wrestling, but all you people already know that. It's me, myself, Josh Williams. You got Bishop Baylor, Griff Gatlin. Let's just say August 6th, we're coming to Madison, West Virginia to take DD Trash. We're going to throw him in the trash, matter of fact. And, but well, let's not get too much into that. No, no, no. Hey, we, got a, we, got a, we got a show to do today. Okay, so yeah. Let's we, get into this. Hey, when he speaks, you listen, because I've watched this cat. They are running, like I said, they're running rough shot over in ASW. They, they're taking no prisoners. They're a bunch of renegades, and they're making a name for themselves. But before he smacks me in the mouth, we're going to get down to what we came here for. Top five favorite heels. No order, Josh. No order because it would no be order. tough. tough. You know, yeah, I agree. Be, I agree. It would be hard to sit down here and say, all right, this one, this one, this one because of this. Because if you've got five favorite heels and you're a heel type of guy, I'm a heel type of guy. We like our, you know, we like heat. I don't know if you like heat. I love heat. So... I'm going to start first. So here you go. All right. Go. I'm going to go with Tully Blanchard. Tully. Not a bad choice. Tully Blanchard was the only choice. member of the original Four Horsemen that never got cheered. Nope. He was a jerk all the time. You know, he was the guy that could really, I mean, a person in the crowd would say, you know, I could, I'm going to whip him so bad. He's just a, he's a, a jerk is a nice way to put it. But Tully was a worker, man. He always had a great valet with him, whether it be Dark, dark Journey, um, Baby Doll. And then, you know, when he smacked her, which was huge back in the oh, 80s. Yeah. Unseen. I, I mean, that. smacked her to the ground. Baby Doll taking that bump was, she was tougher than any guy nowadays. And, you know, J.J. Dillon left her for J.J., cut the promo about leaving a woman. You know, Dusty was like, he left with a man and it was weird. JJ counteracts with the promo about him leaving, spending time with his mom to go on with his dad back when he was younger to work out in the gym. But besides that, Tully, um, His man. suplexes. The, Just, the slingshot suplex. I mean, power power. Oh, Every, yeah. everything he did looked so good that you, you had to hate him. I mean, I how mean, could you not hate somebody? Like Tully Blanchard. Tully could get so much heat, dude. And he was, growing up, I was such a fan of the Crockett promotion. Like, I was blessed and lucky enough to be a middle school kid in the Attitude Era and when Monday Nitro first started, but I had a collection of VHS tapes that I got from like Ma and Pa uh, video stores that was just kind of like, you know, Give them, you never took them back. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Sorry, Darby. Sorry, Charlotte. <laughs> but I would get, you know, War Games 87, Tully versus Dusty Rhodes in the barbed wire. I mean, it was brutal. Tully versus Magnum at Starcade. And I quit, Max. Yeah. Me, and you, me and you actually checked that out in the Bears Den the other day. Best matches of all time. So much, I mean. so much emotion in that match. I mean, it was, I could go on all day long about Tully. Big influence on my career uh, when I first got into the business. And it wasn't no secret that one of the picks, actually a couple of the picks that I have were major influences on me. But Tully, growing up, like I, I, I jumped ahead of myself, I was studying Tully's game on those old VHS tapes when most kids was, you know, tuning in to see Stone Cold. And I was tuning in also. I loved yeah. that. But that was where my homework was coming from was, you know, Tully and the Horseman. Loved it. But I'll shut up. Tully Blanchard, no, not it. I mean, he's my... He's my first one of the night. Go ahead, Josh. The platform is yours. So, my first one I'll pick, I would have to say, growing up, I always hated Randy Orton. You know, 
Great it's just uh, some of my first memories in wrestling, the legend killer, you know what I mean? Oh, that was such a good idea. Him and The Undertaker in 2005. Him and Mick Foley. Jake the Snake coming out on Jericho's... Uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, the Highlight The Highlight Reel, yeah. I mean, all that stuff. And then it, he even took it a step farther when he kicked uh, Vince McMahon and Shane McMahon and kissed Stephanie McMahon. That, that was that what he was with Legacy, wasn't it? Yeah. Dude, the thing with... Uh, the thing with Randy Orton, too, was the angle with Triple H when the home invasion. Oh, I'll never forget Man, that. Man, that was such that a, like It was now. almost like Pillman and Stone, or, yeah, Pillman and Stone Cold deal, kind of modern era. And I was just, like, blown away because I was still into the product of WWE at that time. Pretty big. 2009. Yeah, that was uh, WrestleMania 25 leading up yes, to Yes, it. it was. So, Randy Orton... Another, you know, I mean, even, pick up a worker. even his stuff up until uh, 2012 before he, or I guess 2011. I guess he was a little bit of a face then too. But 2012, when he get it, went against Christian, his stuff was a face then. Mm-hmm. He was still great then. But I love his stuff in 2007, even when he teamed up with Edge and did Rated R. Rated R. Yes. Hey, listen, another good one right there. Uh, and that's Randy Orton is really his longevity is really impressive because. He was the youngest champion up to, I mean, when he won the title, he was the youngest champion ever. That was probably 04 yeah. or something. You know, when I think it was SummerSlam. Summer 04, he won the world championship. Okay, so he was young at that point. I mean, he had, and you could tell what a futurist kid had. And, I mean, what are we right now? 2022, and he's, he's still, still. He's hurt right now. I mean, he's he, I mean with uh, Riddle, the Riddle guy. Yeah. The Riddler, the Riddle. Man, <laughs> he, I mean, that, that got over big. Yeah. So. Randy Orton, Jaws, and got Blanchard and Orton. What a match that would have been. Oh, yeah. All right. Number four on my list. I'm going to mix it up a little bit because this would have been towards the top for me. Is none other than a loose cannon, Brian Pillman. Brian Pillman was, when I first got into wrestling, Brian Pillman, oh, man, I ripped him off so bad. I <laughs> borrowed. I'll say I borrowed. <laughs> the ticking time on Adam Newsom, man, borrowed so much. Brian Pillman, if you've watched Dark Side of the Ring the last season, which a lot of people did, I'm assuming, you got to see the story of how he worked Bischoff and how he worked Vince McMahon and how he worked, I mean, basically him and Kim Woods and uh, Dave Meltzer was, and Kevin Sullivan was the only guys in on that. And which was, he was working the, the boys in the back, which was crazy. They didn't know whether it yeah. was a work or a shoot, but when he went to ECW, and he showed up in that ring when the lights went out. They come back on, and the crowd was cheering him. He did. He healed up on, them. and he had everybody in that ECW arena ready to jump. The, well, one of them tried to, <laughs> and it didn't work out for him. But they were ready to. I mean, he was talking some crazy stuff, talking about OJ Simpson, <laughs> and it was wild. If you've Never seen that. I, it's one of my favorite promos ever, and it's a little bit, it's a little bit adult oriented, but it was cutting edge at the time. The character of the loose cannon. You didn't know what was real. You didn't know what was a work. I mean, it was cutting edge. And like Mick Foley said, he said Pillman's character at the time made everybody else's look second rate. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And Pillman was a worker, man. Pillman with uh, the Hollywood Blondes, him and Stone Cold, one of the most, if not the most underrated tag team, unappreciated tag team ever. Like Stone Cold said, man, or Steve Austin, he said, they put us together to get other guys over, and when we started getting over, they just pulled the rug out from under us. <laughs> and I mean, Pillman could get heat. Pillman didn't like, I mean, he was a jerk, just a great worker when he had the wreck. It was sad because he couldn't do the things he used to be able to do, so he had to rely on a lot of a different tactics, a lot more theatrics and stuff, but man, could he get heat when he was younger, or when he did the loose cannon thing, so that would be my my fourth guy. Not a bad pick at all with Brian Pillman, but my number four would have to be um, somebody growing up that, you know, started out as a baby face and I loved him, and then as a straight edge society, CM Punk, you know, one of the yeah. one of the first people I really actually hated in wrestling. Like I hated that guy. You so felt much. it inside that you yeah. really did not like seeing Punk. And uh, whenever he had the long beard and yes. the long hair, I mean, I think back to Royal Rumble 2010 when he held up the whole Royal Rumble standing in the middle of the ring. Yeah. 
and he eliminates everybody. He's cutting the promo, telling him he needs more, wants more people to come out. I mean, and then he had the feud with Rey Mysterio too. You know? Yes, but did he wear the mask out for that one? Or something? After yeah, after yeah. he got his head shaved, a mask versus hair match. He had Gallows with him and Serena Deeb. Yes, you know? I, I can remember that faction. He had her shave her head. Yeah, be his follower or whatever. Yeah, he would bring in random people from the crowd. crowd. And then he went to be with the Nexus right after that. I can remember uh, that. 2011. That was a, you know, CM Punk's another one, man. He's kind of got a jerk. I mean, even when he's a baby face, you kind of get like a heel vibe to him. Yeah. I mean, he's, he don't really seem that likable of a person. No. You know, he kind of seems like a, a stuck up snob, as I would say, but heck of a heel, great baby face also. He was teetering on that stone cold kind of anti-hero. I mean, he was starting to get that. I felt like it was getting ready to be a real big deal. And then WWE, for whatever reason, kind of just, it's like when Nash came out, Jack Knight, him and Alberto Del Rio. That's insane. That's just insane. I mean, I was looking forward to something happening with that and it never did. Nothing ever came of it. Doesn't surprise me. Nothing surprised me that WWE does. <laughs> Another, ever since about 2017, nothing has surprised me that they've done. No, and you know, it's like I said, CM Punk, great choice. You've had CM Punk, Randy Orton, two solid picks. I've had Tully and Brian Pillman. So, I mean, a lot of heels, a lot of good workers we've had so far with the next one I'm going to go someone similar in personality than Pillman which would be Terry Funk so Terry Here Funk yeah, Terry Funk the hardcore king you know well Mick Foley may disagree or whatever they had the death match or whatever <laughs> Terry Funk scared me as a kid you know how you said a BS kind of freaked you out as a kid man I can remember being three four year old watching WCW and Terry Funk looking dead into the camera and talking about what he was going to do to somebody yeah. and he just had that you could tell he was a few fries short of a happy meal man and he, he was a he was a crazed Texan I mean he played that part perfect but his feud with oh man Ric Flair and Steamboat just had finished one of the greatest matches ever Terry Funk had just come off doing a few movies he'd done um over the top with Stallone and Roadhouse with Patrick Swayze. Yeah. So he he come back into wrestling. He was the guest timekeeper. He comes into the ring after Flair defeats Steamboat, starts talking to him, interviewing him, tells him he wants to be in line to challenge him for the belt next. Well, Flair cuts a promo saying you've been out in Hollywood rubbing shoulders with Stallone and Patrick Swayze or whatever. You need to get in line with the rest. And just so Terry took it like he was embarrassed. Felt like he, he embarrassed him or whatever. And the way he played it off, I'm sorry, Rick, I didn't mean it like that. You know, I should have never, I apologize, Rick. <laughs> the player's trying to play it off and about that time. He said, I, just, I respect him about that time. Boom, just Terry Funk blindsides him. Terry Funk beats him, drags him outside, pile drives him on a table. It's the first time I've ever seen him that like it. And uh, Flair actually said that wasn't even playing. Terry just dragged yeah. him and said it. Well, the work. crazy thing was, man, was, on an episode like on TBS or something, Terry Funk took a plastic bag and put over <laughs> Flyer's head, and they back got kicked off Turner over that. Like he yeah. was gonna smother him. So Terry Funk, man, him and Bruiser Brody battle. I mean, yeah, he sure. fought. Terry Funk was a bad dude. I mean, he was in his mid fifties, and if you can hear Paul Heyman talk about how influential he was to the locker room of oh, ECW, yeah. man how he came out. I can't remember what the triple threat match. I think it was him, Sabu, and was it Stevie Richards or Raven or something? I don't know, but he puts the ladder up and he starts going around hitting them and everything. And uh, he done, he just, Terry Funk, that was him being a baby face at the time. But anyways, yeah. his heel stuff in the late 80s, early 90s, Gary Hart is the manager. Check oh, yeah. it out. So that was my three. And I'm not doing the triple threat, Shane Douglas thing. Maybe I should do. Anyways, go ahead. <laughs> my number three would have to be Triple H, the King of Kings. You know, when you think back to Triple H, I, the first thing that comes to my mind is him coming back, 2000, was it two? Was it after the knee injury? Yeah, yeah. 2000. Or the quad or something? Yeah, 2003 maybe? No, it was before, 2001 maybe. Anyway, what I'm getting to, his heel, his heel run against Shawn Michaels at SummerSlam. Oh, that was good 2003, stuff. that was 2003. 
That's one of my favorite matches mm-hmm. of all time. And then you look at him against Goldberg with Evolution. Yes. Evolution, one of the best one matches of, yeah. of all time. Listen, it was a modern day horseman. Oh, it yeah. Was, it was, yeah, it yeah. was done. Evolution was done near perfect, I thought. And uh, then if you look at Triple H, you know, as a heel against Daniel Bryan in 2014, that's one of the best authority figures since Vince McMahon. Yeah, it you worked know, out good, man. Him and Stephanie. Mm-hmm. Kane. Know. They kind of had the corporation going, but if it was the, uh, what was they calling uh, themselves? Shoot, I'm embarrassed. They were the authority. The authority. Yeah, and it. then uh, everybody talked about how they hated Triple H. Well, I mean, that's, the, that's your job. Yeah, that's, that's your job. What, he's and still doing it. Look, look how over he got mm-hmm. Daniel Brown. You know what I mean? So, well, and you know what? I was listening to a podcast the other day, and I can't remember who it was that they were talking about. I'll tell you who it was. It was Diamond Dallas Page and Jake Roberts' of Snake Pit. And they were doing like a Mount Rushmore of baby faces, and I think Jake the Snake had put Daniel Bryan on it. He said because Daniel Bryan on that cage at the end of the show. Oh, that was the most. He said he'd never seen anything like that. Daniel Bryan was probably, and people won't, but he was one of the most over guys for a certain period of time. He wasn't like a Hulk Hogan over where he was over for like two, three years, or John Cena over where he was, but he was so over for like. He was the most over guy of my childhood. Like, there was nothing, it was nothing to be a Daniel Bryan. Like, when I say everybody at my school was a Daniel Bryan fan, yeah. everybody I knew was a Daniel Bryan fan. Well, he got yeah. over, man. It was, it was like anything, it was, I hadn't seen anybody get that over since a long, you know, since yeah. I was really big into it. And it was good for him because he worked hard to get over. Oh, yeah. And, you know, he had Triple H and those guys to help him. I mean, he had good, Bray Wyatt, he had good, he had good heels to work against at that time. So... Excellent, excellent choice there, though. Triple H, legend, founding member of DX, terrorizing. <laughs> <laughs> They'll have to check that one out. Terrorizing is WCW and Jean Paul Levesque oh, yeah. with Steve Regal. So, all right, I'm down to my fourth pick right now. And I'm not, everybody's gonna know that Rick Rude is on my list, right? So, we're gonna go with him for the fourth pick. And what can I say that I've not said before? Um, the way he would come out, man, carry himself, come to the ring, hands on the road, walking with Bobby Heenan, get in the ring, cut the promo about all the sweat hogs and out of shape and bring a woman in and kiss her and she'd faint. And <laughs> nobody had the body. He, I mean, he was just straight up, man, a savage. And he was a tough guy. The thing about Rick Rude that was so cool to me was, yes, he was a ladies' man, but he was a notorious tough guy, too. So it wasn't yeah. like he was a pansy out there, you know. And he was, I mean, he sold an atomic dry. He sold so good, man. His in-ring work was top-notch. He would, if you heard, like Steamboat said in the Hall of Fame, if he heard him, you know, he would milk that. He would sell that injury throughout the whole match. And it was, I, I mean, I'm... 37 years old now, I study Rick Rude daily. Yeah. I study his work daily because it's such an inspiration to me. And I could, I mean, just, I could, you his know. His facials are so good. Yes, everything, man. I carry myself in public like right <laughs> Rick Rude. This man needs Jeez. some Tylenol, sinus, and I need cold, And brought to you by. Tylenol, sinus, and cold. <laughs> Josh Williams, the working class. But it cash this number four. Yes, number four. Um, I had one planned, but I wanted to switch it. But I think I am going to go with this one because it is a very underrated pick that a lot of people would forget to say. But I think a lot of people would say it. It's Dolph Ziggler. Yes, because Dolph Ziggler, he had the, he was, he had the heel run for so long, and he cashed in the money in the bank, and then he. He was getting ready to turn baby face and he got the concussion. But leading up to that, when he had the money in the bank, that run was an incredible run for Dolph Ziggler. I always and felt I like Dolph was on that point of getting over and something kept him from just getting completely over. Because, I mean, he's one of the best workers that I've oh, yeah. ever seen. Compatible to Mr. Perfect. Yes, Henny. Yeah. I mean, that's what I was getting ready to say. He's henny like Yeah. And the way that, um, I mean, he bumped so good, man. You know, Henny was bigger. 
But Dolph, I mean, Dolph Ziggler was just. But Dolph has, I think, I don't know, there's something about Dolph. He's just got more emotion to him. Yeah. Than perfect. Yeah, he has more energy. Yeah. You know, perfect was kind of laid back and cocky and. And that was that was probably better for that style, but mm-hmm. Ziggler into he, he fits today's style. Yeah, he know? does. And you know, Perfect's another great heel. I mean, he's he could have very well been on, oh, yeah. on my list. But um, I mean, if you look at Dolph Ziggler, every time that he's he's been every time he's been right there. At yes, the main event guy, main event guy. And I think nearly to the main top. I mean, I think it's just too. He's like going to be like one of those guys like Booker T, where. He was almost there. Well, Booker T even had the world title. Right? I think t- I think Booker yeah. T may have got. He was the man at one point, very short. Because he had the W. I, I mean, not really in WC, WWE, but in WCW, you know, he had yeah. the reigns. Vince Russo was really high on Booker T at the and, end of WCW. Uh, but Ziggler, I think he just made people look good. Other mm-hmm. guys look good. Well, he know? did. Who was it? Goldberg came back and speared him. He oh, did yeah. so good. <laughs> Spear is so good. Um, but he was on Raw last week, so I heard he came back. Yeah, he came back. Look, maybe this. he gets another rain. I doubt Let's it. Hope. But Let's hope. Let's hope. I always pull for those guys. I mean, what's him the and Luke Harper? I've, I've almost forgot that match, but that was one of the best matches I remember from my childhood. TLC, the yes. last match. I was there. Oh, really? Yes. Incredible man. Yeah, Luke Incredible. Harper, man, was my favorite modern day wrestler. Oh yeah, it was incredible. I loved Luke Harper with the White Family. I loved Luke Harper. I love it. I mean, he just had a good look. He was Brody, like, which, you know, you can tell he's got that influence. Oh, yeah. And when he passed away, man, that was just like a punch in the stomach because he was doing so good. Yeah. Yeah. And nobody really knows what happened. I mean, he was doing really well in AEW. He had a killer faction going. He had great things ahead for a long time. And the the thing about him was he – it's almost like the Steam deal where – you never hear anybody in the business talk bad about Sting as the person. Nobody. You will I mean, I, the only thing I ever heard was Dick Slater and him having a, an issue. But other than that, nobody. I mean, Eric Bischoff puts him over, and that's the way with Luke Harper. You know, they're got foundations in his name and stuff. I and heard they like to rat on the boys to their women, but who uh, Sting? But that's that's a different story. I that's guess. a different story. That's a different <laughs> podcast. A wild time right there. Uh, number one for me is. It's going to be a shock. It's an independent guy. I wonder who it is. It's an independent guy. I just switched this up. It got me thinking when we were talking about great heels that would sell. Is Michael Jameson. Michael Jameson is former BCW heavyweight champion. Former, He's actually a Grand Slam champion. And the dude was just like the guys we talked about. He's almost unlikable. He's got an unlikable feel to him. But he's... One of my best friends, yet I know him, so I know the real dude. But he does his job and does it well because I'm telling you, I've watched him do some real dastard. I've t- I'm telling you, right now, <laughs> I've watched him do some real. You talk about heat. I mean, I watched him tell a lady in a wheelchair that he, you know, she was a holler, and this woman was loud, love her heart. And she just, rah, 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 I mean, just non stop. And he's cutting a promo. I'm in the ring with him. I'm young, and this, you know, at this point, I'm still green as grass. And he turns around, you know, I don't know what he's, I thought he was going to no sell it. He looks at that woman in the city of Martin and says, if you don't shut your mouth, I'm going to wheel you out into traffic and leave you there. He told that woman that. That's a good one. I'll tell you another good one. I'm sorry. We were leaving a show one night. You just had no women. Women titles and fame, WTF was our group. And it was, I mean, I was just basically the muscle. And he was, he was the, I mean, he was getting all the heat. So, anyways, we're leaving a show one night. And these little babies love their hearts. They came out. They were wanting to meet all the wrestlers. That little baby walks up to him and says, "Will you pick me up?" He looks at that baby and says, "I'm not lifting you up. This ain't like a five, six. This kid's like three. She could have been lost looking for her mom or dad or anything." And he told the kid he wouldn't want to pick her up. But that's just two stories I could tell on this cat. But you will not. The dude could work. He made everybody look good. Um, he made guys that had no business being in a wrestling ring look good. I've watched him. I've watched him do some funny stuff in the ring. I've watched him take a guy and, like I said, had no business being there. He, I mean, he shot him off, made him run the ropes. This guy was out of shape. He was throwing him against the turnbuckles. I mean, had him ready to throw up in the ring. The guy rolls out of the ring and quits. Takes his hat, gets his hat, puts his hat back on. He wore a hat out of the ring and leaves. 
And that's just part of it. Tapped out, got to the back, and he was talking, but you couldn't understand what he was saying. A man, Mitch, God, God rest his soul. We were watching it on the tele teleprompter in the back, and he said, "They call me Bomb, ticking time bomb." They said, "Bomb," or Mitch said, "Bomb." I think he just quit in the middle of the match, and we just doubled over laughing. And uh, so Mikey and uh, Kobe just worked this dude over. It didn't really even punch him or not, just made him work, run and stuff. And the guy quit, but obviously he came back. But Michael Jameson, he's up there, man. I don't care, dude. I'm, I'm talking like. The dude could have got a heat in the big leagues. But that's my number one. So I'm going to leave the young man, Josh Williams, working class. So my number one is Kicking. not a wrestler, but it is my favorite persona, favorite person of wrestling history. It is Jim Cornette. I think he is the greatest heel of all time. I think he can get the most heat out of anybody of all time. I mean... Can you really get better than Jim Cornette? Look at him. He's, a, he's the biggest heel in wrestling today. Oh, he's a, he's not even I mean, a heel. I mean, a lot of people see him as a heel, as a person. Exactly. You know That's what I'm saying. saying. And uh, personally, I think he might be working every almost everything that he does just to get a reaction. And He's still getting heat, man. Exactly. That's what I'm years. saying. And I'm, you know, I've been lucky enough to meet him and stuff, man. And he don't care what he says. He don't care where he says it. He don't care who he says it to. And that's why you gotta love him. Yeah. I mean, man. does not you really. You either love him or you hate him. Yes. I, I love him. I love him. He's been cool to me, and I, I, we share a lot of the same views on a lot of stuff. And I've been lucky enough to work with him a few times. Cracks me up too. I'll tell you, tell you a story real fast. I'm Cornette. We was working a show over at Martin, and got in the back. We were in these tents, and it was our dressing room. And you know, I was talking. Everybody's talking to Cornette. So I said, you know, what was up? What was Brian Pillman like, you know, to work with and stuff? And he's he was talking about how much he loved Brian and what a great kid he was when he first got in the business. He said he didn't do nothing. He said he was just straight up good, straight laced kind of guy. And he said later on down the road he got mixed up stuff that kind of took over the rest of his life. And he said you know, I was there the night he died. I got I was the one that got the phone call at yeah. the show. And he said when they told me. He said, I told Bruce Pritchard to come here now. And he said, I just give him the phone while, you know, I left. He said, I couldn't take it. And then after that, after he told everybody, everybody started crowding around. He said, and thank you for bringing the mood down tonight. And I walked off. <laughs> you know, uh, in the Cornet, uh Dairy Queen incident. Is that one of the greatest promos that's, ever? That's probably the greatest promo of all time. My goodness. People talk about punk. Punk's pop bomb or MJF's pop bomb? What about Cornette's pop bomb? And you know what? But Jericho Dairy like antagonized yeah. and kept him going. <laughs> That's so That's awesome. That's the best part of it. It I is. Think, I think that might be the greatest video in wrestling history. It makes me. I mean. And it happened, what, 10, 15, 20 minutes down the road? Probably. Yeah, I mean, it's right down the road. And they still love it, though, at that Dairy Queen. They take yeah. pride in it. Cornette yeah. done that. That's awesome. So we have sat here and gave you 10 for all you wrestling fans. We gave you 10 great heels to go do your homework. Check these guys out because they're all over YouTube. You can find them from Michael Jameson to Triple H to Tully Blanchard to Ravishing Rick Rude to Randy Orton. They're all there. So, Josh, let me tell you something. I really enjoyed having you on here tonight. You and know well, your I appreciate stuff, you man. having me on here. You know your stuff. You're passionate about the business. You know... I feel honored to have been able to kind of guide you in the right direction here. Uh, the the sky's the limit for you, man. And I'll tell everybody that. I tell everybody I say that. You know, you and Griff got something good going. Uh, and like I said, I'm really proud of you all. You're, you're going to be big in this if you keep your head on stuff. You're going to be big in professional wrestling because a working class hero is something to be. Yeah, that's what everybody wants to be, but very few can do it. And let me tell you this, August 6th, we're going to prove that we are working class heroes. Let me tell you, we're just heroes all around. We're the best all around. Bruce, Ron, we're coming August 6th. We started right here in the Bears' Den, and we're going to finish it in Madison, West Virginia. And that's all I got to say about that. All right, let me tell you something. You better listen to the boy, because I have seen him in action. I've watched this dude get out of Happy Mart and smack three punks around, take their billfold, realize they had nothing in it, throw the billfold back down, and talk trash to them for being broke. So, 
<laughs> We're going to leave it at that. Listen, first episode tonight. Enjoyed it. I appreciate you having me Hey, I love you, my man. Listen, we'll be back. There's going to be more we'll wrestling back. talk. Hey, subscribe. Subscribe to Adam Newsom. Comment your favorite heels below. Too. Yes, yes. Throw your favorite heels. We're going to edit this, and I will see you shortly. Yeah, there you go.